Sure, that applies. Oh, we didn't really get a piece of the corporation. All right. So. So remember, when the Bill of Rights was created, it applied only to the federal government, right? And we talked about why. Did we talk about history a little bit? Wait, why the federal government was made? Well, yes. So when the states agreed to a strong central government or a stronger central government, their big concern was too much power in the federal government, right? So they made branches and stuff. They did the separation of powers. They did the federalism thing. They were more worried about like the individual person to use the bill of rights, sort of like how the government could interfere with people's lives. Right, but specifically, they were concerned about how the federal government was going to infringe on the individual's rights. They weren't concerned about the state governments because they were the state governments, right? They had their own constitutions. A lot of them had their own bill of rights. The bill of rights was based on the Virginia Bill of Rights, right? So the states already were covered as far as they were concerned. They weren't interested in a Bill of Rights in the Constitution to protect against the states. They were interested in protecting against the federal government infringing on citizens' rights. So the Bill of Rights didn't apply to the states. It only applied to the federal government. When the 14th Amendment was adopted, though, it provided that you are a citizen of both the United States and the state in which you reside. And that individual state cannot deprive you of privileges and immunities guaranteed you by the Constitution. So this thing right here, the Due Process Clause in the Fifth Amendment, the protected against abuse of people by the federal government, all of a sudden, was being applied to the states through the 14th Amendment. Because the 14th Amendment basically said, if you're a citizen of the United States, as well as the state that you live in, and that state can't deprive you of your rights, your federal rights, then that means these things that we never applied to the states before all of a sudden start applying to the states. So it would make sense then that all the Bill of Rights would then apply to the states, right? But that is not what the Supreme Court said. What the Supreme Court said is, well, here's what we're going to do. If you have a claim, you have a problem, you think the state's depriving you of some right, then you can bring an action and come and we'll tell you whether that right applies against the states. Why would they do that? Why would the Supreme Court do that? Because it's sort of like, don't fix what's not broken, so there's a lot of these situations where that would be. Okay, that could be one approach. Don't fix what's not broken. What might be another reason why the Supreme Court was weary about taking a really big step of just saying, the whole Bill of Rights applies to the states now all of a sudden? Because if it doesn't work, Okay, that would be sort of an extension of Colby's thing. Yes, that's another point. How about the fact that, remember, what, what power does the Supreme Court have to enforce its rulings? The, the power of people. That's basically what it is, um, the power of people. Judicial review is the way that they can reach over and rule on stuff. But if the, if the president issues an executive order and people don't follow it, what can he do about it? He, can you repeat that? If the president issues an executive order and people don't follow it, what can he do about it? He has the power to enforce the law. He has the power to enforce the laws. He's got a, a military. He's got a police force. He can go out there and force people to comply with the laws. What can the Supreme Court do if somebody doesn't follow their ruling? They, they can bring it to the president. They're trying not to make people yeah. angry because if they don't like the ruling and they don't follow it, then... Right. That is, is exactly right. 
So that was the genius of Marbury versus Madison in the first place. Remember, Marbury versus Madison recognized judicial uh, review authority in the Supreme Court, right? But the way that Marshall did that is he didn't get the uh, president pissed off because instead of say, instead of challenging the president, he actually gave the president what he wanted. Remember, Marbury was saying, I want my commission. The former president, the outgoing president, duly gave me my commission. It just hadn't been served yet, so I, I deserve my commission. So Madison didn't want to give him his commission. So if the Supreme Court had challenged Madison, what's Madison likely to do? It's probably just going to tell the Supreme Court to go jump in the lake. He said, I don't care what you say, I'm not giving him his commission. So instead, Marshall writes a decision that says, you know what? It's not our place to tell the president that he has to give Marbury his commission. So then the president says, well, awesome, that's just what I wanted, so I'm happy. However, what Marshall did in the process of saying that is we, the Supreme Court, have a right to decide whether we can tell the president it's our place or not. So. The genius of that decision was without challenging the president and thereby getting the president, risking the president just rejecting the decision, the marshal ended up screwing over Marbury in the process, so that guy never got his commission. But the Supreme Court ended up with judicial review. So they, the Supreme Court says, we have a right to decide whether what the other branches of government do is constitutional. We have a right to decide that. And we're deciding in this particular case that the president could do what he did. So he walked that fine line of taking power for the court without, at the same time, challenging the president. That's what the Supreme Court has had to do throughout history. Issue rulings that claim power for the court while at the same time not going so far that people say, uh, no, nah, I don't think so, we're not going to do that, right? They're relying on the people accepting what the court says and going along with it. So one reason why they might not have wanted to just take the whole Bill of Rights and apply it to the states is they might have said, you know what? That might be going a little bit too far, and let's just take it piecemeal, one at a time. Okay, and the process of doing that is called selective incorporation. And what that just means is they are selectively incorporating individual rights within the Bill of Rights against the states based on individual claims of people. So throughout the last hundred years, we have seen different people come and make claims and sue that the, my First Amendment rights have been violated by the state, or my Fifth Amendment rights have been violated by the state. And the courts just said over and over again, uh, yeah, that's right, they have these rights and the state can't violate them. So they've incorporated all these different rights within the Bill of Rights against the states on a peaceful basis. Okay, so I went through all that just to point out the significance of the Fifth Amendment as the federal due process and now the Fourteenth Amendment as it applies those against the states, right? When it comes to civil rights, the big provision of the 14th Amendment is that Equal Protection Clause. And that simply says that we're going to treat our citizens equally regardless of race. Specifically, it was race, okay? But Equal Protection extends beyond that, right, Bella? <laughs> beyond just race, okay? So. Um, so, that gets us to these tests that Craig was talking about in the video. Right? A rational basis test. Okay, here's the deal. How do we decide whether the government is violating equal protection, Bella? 
How do we decide whether government is violating equal protection of citizens? So we're just going to judge them and then... We bring, bring it to the Supreme Court. Yeah, you bring up the charges and bring it to the Supreme Court. Okay, but how does the Supreme Court weigh whether it's a violation? Yeah, Brandon. By the story behind it and also just um, by you knowing uh, what your rights are and when you, uh, if it is violated and you have proof, you could bring it to the Supreme Court. Okay, yes, but... For example, let's say that there's a law that treats Brandon and me differently. Okay. Is the Supreme Court going to be as suspicious of that law as a law that he...